Well, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you all in the Lord's house this evening. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to John chapter 6 with me? John chapter 6. And uh, this evening, as we've been doing uh, up until now on our uh, Wednesday uh, live streams, uh, we're continuing in our study of Romanism, our study of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, tonight, the topic that we're looking at uh, is the topic of the Lord's Table, the, the topic of what uh, is uh, called by many Christian groups and by uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eucharist, uh, the, the celebration and remembrance of the death of Christ for us. And uh, so I want us to uh, look at that and what it means to the Roman Catholic and what it means to us as we read the scripture. And so if you have your Bibles in John 6, we'll begin reading in verse 35 together. The scripture says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for Christ and uh, the work that he did for us on the cross. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you've given us over into his hands, and uh, Lord, that he does not cast out any of his own. Uh, Lord, we pray tonight that you would help us to understand what uh, the table uh, means that you've given to us, uh, to remember his, cry, uh, his uh, crucifixion by Lord. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would give us strength in studying this to uh, go to our friends and family uh, that are uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, Lord, to uh, be friendly to them, to bear witness to them, uh, that they should uh, see what the true meaning of the supper is, and uh, not that they should trust in bread and, and in drink, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask by him that you'd forgive us where we failed you, and Lord, that you'd give us the grace to bear witness to him in the days ahead. It's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen. So we're looking at the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And as we've been doing, I'd just like to lay out first what it is that the Roman Catholic Church teaches on the Lord's Supper. And the Roman view is that in the Supper, there is a physical presence of Jesus Christ's body and blood, and that that presence is a sacrificial presence. That when uh, the, the uh, bread and wine are blessed, Christ is physically rendered present on the altar and that this is offered up as a sacrifice to God on behalf of the people. First, we'll see how they see that uh, Christ is uh, physically present, how they say. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Catechism, uh, in section 1357, we read, We carry out this command of the Lord by celebrating the memorial of his sacrifice. In so doing, we offer to the Father what he has himself given us, the gift of his creation, bread and wine, which by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the word of Christ have become the body and blood of Christ. Christ is thus really and mysteriously present, uh, made present. And in section 1375, it is by the conversion of the body and blood uh, the, 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 of the bread and wine into, the, into Christ's body and blood, that Christ becomes present in this sacrament. So they talk about uh, the bread and wine being converted into the body and blood of Christ. Uh, this is a, mysterial, uh, a, a, a mysterious thing uh, that uh, occurs, uh, that, that he is rendered present by a miracle, uh, and so... Uh, he is literally there. Um, and that this sacrifice, th this uh, presence is therefore rendered as a sacrifice to God. That, that, that Christ's sacrifice is being represented on the altar. In section 1367 of the Catechism, it says, The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. The same now offers through the ministry of, the, of priests who then offered himself on the cross. Only the manner of offering is different. 
in this divine sacrament, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who suffered, who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is, con uh, is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. And so the, the same sacrifice we see that the Christ offered on the cross is said to be offered on the altar. Uh, the one time it was offered in a bloody manner, that is in a, a manner uh, that killed him, that it resulted in his death, but in perpetuity it is in an unbloody manner. It does not result in his death, but it's nonetheless the same sacrifice being offered up again and again. And so because of this view of the sacrament, the uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, sees two implications that are given for church life. First, as we've mentioned before, is that the sacrament of the Eucharist is salvific, that it saves those who come to the table. In section 1359 of the Catechism, we read that the Eucharist, the sacrament of our salvation, accomplished by Christ on the cross, is also a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for the work of creation. So it's the sacrament of our salvation that it calls it in section 1414. As sacrifice, the Eucharist is also offered in re uh, reparation for the sins of the living and the dead and to obtain spiritual or temporal benefits from God. So the sacrifice of the Eucharist as the Catholic sees it is in reparation for sins. It actually uh, puts right uh, sins by the, by the rendering of Christ's body and blood present on the altar, by the communicant uh, taking of that altar. Uh, it is actually uh, a means of uh, atoning for sins. It, it, is, it is a sacrifice in every way as Christ's sacrifice in his death, uh, except that, uh, that it is uh, unbloody. It, it nonetheless has the same kind of um, effect, that it, it, it uh, atones for sins. And so it is seen as salvific. And second, the second implication that they draw is that because Christ is present on the altar, therefore worship, adoration, is due to the elements. That, that the worship of the elements is, a pro, is, is, according to them, a proper response to the table. Uh, in the Catechism, section 1378, uh, worship of the Eucharist, worship of the Eucharist, in the liturgy of the Mass, we express our faith in the real presence of Christ under the species of bread and wine by, among other ways, genuflecting or bowing deeply as a sign of adoration of the Lord. The Catholic Church has always offered and still offers to the sacrament of the Eucharist the cult of adoration, that is the service, the, the, um, the, the religion of adoration, not only during Mass, but also outside of it, reserving the consecrated hosts with the utmost care, exposing them to the solemn veneration of the faithful and carrying them in procession. So there's a lot there that's said. Well, what it's saying is because they say that Christ is really present, that therefore, and, and that Christ is worthy of adoration as God, therefore, when he is rendered present on the altar, that veneration is due to him. Worship is due to him. Uh, for this reason, they, as it says, they carry about the host in procession. They, they lift it up above the congregation and they carry it into the mass for all to render worship to it. Uh, also, when the supper is over for them, they will take the remnants that are left behind of the host of the, the bread and wine and they'll set them apart uh, in the church for future religious use and for the worship of the people when they come into the church. Uh, if you see a Catholic going into uh, the church, at least if he's a, a, a devout Catholic, uh, then he will bow when he goes into the church. He'll bow before, towards the altar. And that's because behind the altar they have uh, the remnants of the host. And he is 
uh, he is ostensibly doing uh, worship to, uh, to Christ when he does that. Uh, and there are other uh, implications of this. One is that if you do not worship the host, then you are in sin when you come to take of it. If you are in mortal sin when you take of the host, you, t uh, you eat actual, uh, you eat and drink uh, actual eternal damnation to yourself. Uh, and there are other, um, there are other uh, uh, superstitions which surround the, uh, the practice of the Eucharist. And so all of this, this is the, uh, generally the Roman Catholic view of what the Eucharist is. And now we'll go to examine uh, what the scripture says about this. And whereas the Catholic view is that Christ is physically present as the host, as the uh, bo uh, body and blood on the altar, the scripture says that Christ is spiritually present, not physically, but spiritually present with his people, and that the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of Christ. Uh, it is not Christ himself, but it is a remembrance of Christ. Christ's sacrifice was accomplished on the cross. We saw that the Roman Catholic views this, the sacrament as a sacrifice for sins. The scripture says that Christ's sacrifice was completed on the cross. It was a once for all sacrifice for his people that was done with when Christ died. In John 19 verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. No more sacrifice to be made. That was it. It was finished. The only work left for Christ is to bear witness to his sacrifice, not to offer up the sacrifice again and again daily. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. When Christ finished purging our sins, he sat down. He was finished with that work. He had purged our sins, never to be repeated again. In Hebrews 10 verse 9, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Notice, notice the language. It's the offering of the body of Christ, his sacrifice for us once for all. Not once uh, every mass that comes around. Not once in every parish where a Christ is uh, worshipped, but once for all he did this for us. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That is the, the offering of bulls and goats, the, the, the temporal sacrifices. In verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified when the scripture talks about the sacrifice of Christ it's not a sacrifice that needs to be repeated it's not a sacrifice that needs to be brought up uh, and 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 re-sacrificed to God again it is a once for all eternal sacrifice. And so when, um, when the Catholic Church brings out the host, when they offer it as a sacrifice, this is uh, detestable to the uh, biblical witness because it implies that the first time that Christ did this, it wasn't enough. That this needed to be done again and again and again every time the believer stepped mass every time uh, the, uh, the church uh, brings that around and they uh, they celebrate uh, the Lord's table now all of this we can uh, the, the we can see historically why the the Roman Catholic Church came to this uh, how exactly this this came about uh, as we said before the um, the the sacrament of the Lord's table historically has been called 
the Eucharist. Even from the earliest times of Christianity, Greek-speaking Christians called it the Eucharist, uh, which simply means the thanksgiving offering. It's, it's giving thanks to God. Uh, and in the scripture, uh, when we look at thanksgiving to God, what that means, uh, we also see that thanksgiving is called a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that we render of our own goodwill towards God or, or, or out, of, out of thanksgiving towards God. Uh, we offer him praise because we are thankful to him. In 1 Peter 2, 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 13, 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the sacrifice of praise is giving thanks to God's name. So when we come to the table and when we, when we bless the, the bread and we thank God for it and, and all that he does uh, in our lives and, and, and through gathering together to take the Lord's table, we are offering up a free will offering to God. Not a, an offering that atones for sins, but a, but a sacrifice of thanksgiving to him, that, that, that we're praising his name, and that's called a sacrifice to him. We're thankful to him. And so historically, when uh, the church began to speak of the Lord's table as the Eucharist, the thanksgiving offering, and when they began to conjoin that rightly with the idea of our giving sacrifice to God, giving thanksgiving to him uh, and, and calling that a sacrifice that we render, uh, some people began to misunderstand and they began to, uh, they began to uh, think of the sacrifice as being what was on the table rather than what was in their heart, rather than, than what they were praying and they were giving God thanks at the table. They thought that Christ's body and blood really was on the table and that it was really being offered as a sacrifice for sin at the table uh, and so we see how that happened uh, just uh, a uh, an unfortunate uh, consequence of the language that started to be used of the table uh, but nonetheless it's wrong and horribly wrong from the scripture and so since we see that Christ sacrifice was once for all and that it is not represented on the altar therefore taking the sacrament taking the lord's table is not necessary for individual salvation uh, it is not needful for you to take the lord's table or to take it often in order to be saved uh, we read a passage um, uh, earlier together in john 6 uh, another passage in John 6 that's usually brought up to, um, to support the idea uh, that this is salvific, that the Lord's table is salvific, is John 6, 53 to 58. And verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he, he continues on in that same vein. He's saying that you must come to the Son of Man, you must eat his flesh and drink his blood, otherwise there is no life in you. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church takes this and they, they say, well, this looks an awful lot like the Lord's table. And so we'll take this and apply it to the Lord's table, that you must eat the transubstantiated body of Christ, the transubstantiated blood of Christ, otherwise there's no life in you. But this verse is found, as we said in John 6, uh, the same passage that we read earlier. In verse 35 we read, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus has already set up, what does it mean to uh, come to him? What does it mean or, or to or what does it mean to eat of him? What does it mean to drink of him? It is to come to him to believe on him. He is the bread of life, and coming and believing on him, we have eternal life. 
In John 6, verse 60 also, we read, Many therefore of his disciples, and this is in response to him saying, Eat my flesh, drink my blood. When they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He, he says that when they heard, when they heard, eat my flesh, drink my blood, they were offended. And Christ says, this is spirit. The words I speak are spirit and life. The flesh profits nothing. What you eat with your mouth doesn't matter. What matters is in spirit, are you relying on me? Do you gain your sustenance from me? Uh, am I the one that causes you to live? And that's what matters. Have you come to him? Have you believed on him? That is, uh, that is what matters. Not whether we come to a physical table and eat physical meat and physical drink, but rather whether we come to Christ and we have life through him. Also then, the practice of rendering worship to the elements and saving them for religious uses is again completely repugnant to scripture uh, the scripture gives no warrant for doing such a thing in exodus uh, 20 verse 3 we read thou shalt have no other gods before me thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. We are not to render worship to anything other than God. We're not to worship any creature, any created thing, whether we have made it to at, resemble something in heaven or not we're not to bow down and render adoration to it uh, even god ordained symbols can become sinful if we abuse them in this way even if god gave to us the uh, the sacrament of the lord's table and we come to it worshiping the lord's table worshiping this god ordained symbol then our worship is is disgusting in his eyes that we have polluted the table of the lord god gave israel a symbol in numbers chapter 21 when he gave to them the bronze serpent that he lifted up and and he said whoever looks to this serpent shall live and that symbol uh, foreshadowed christ it, it was it was to show what christ would come and do for his people but in second kings 18 in verses 1 to 4, we read what Israel did to this symbol. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And in verse 4, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the bro groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nahashat. Uh, the, uh, they had taken this bronze serpent, the symbol God had given them to remember his salvation, and they began to worship it. They began to burn incense to this symbol. Even though we know that it was a symbol of Christ, they were burning incense to it. They had begun to adore it instead of Christ. And so even if it's a God-ordained symbol, something he gave us to do, we are not to render worship to any created thing. And as we've seen, the bread and the wine at the Lord's table is a created thing. It does not become the body and blood of Christ. Christ was offered on the cross. Christ finished his work there. Christ has ascended into heaven. He is not on the earth. And so what we eat at the table is not Christ's body and blood. 
Now, finally, I'd like to um, explore uh, how it is that Christ is truly present with us when we take the table. He is not on the table. He is not the bread and the wine, uh, but he is nonetheless present with his people. He is with us. He does uh, give us grace when we come together. Uh, turn to John 14 and verse 15 with me, and we'll uh, be quick about this and, uh, and finish up. John 14, verse 15. First, we see that Christ is present with his people, not physically, but by his spirit. We remember earlier Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Unless ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life. And the words I speak to you are spirit and life. Christ is spiritually present with us, not by bread and wine, but by his spirit. In John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. When Christ sends his Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to his people, he communicates his presence to his people through the Holy Ghost. The presence of the Holy Ghost being with us communicates Christ's spiritual presence to us even though he's in heaven, even though he is with the Father. When we gather together and, and we come uh, to be comforted in God's people, to be comforted by the teaching of the gospel, he is present with us to comfort us in the Spirit. Matthew 18, verse 20, likewise says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. When we come to take the table, he is there with us. We are gathered in his name. We pray by his name. Uh, we are called by his name. And he is with us. And also, when we come together to the table, our conversation, just as, as Christ's spiritual presence is here with us, our spiritual presence is likewise in heaven with Christ. We are counted as being with him in the spirit. Our presence is also communicated into the heavens in Hebrews 12 and verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Notice in 22 it says, but ye are come unto, and in verse 24, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. When we come by faith to Christ, we come to him. We are counted present with him. And so when we gather together, when we come to take of the Lord's table, he truly is present with us. We truly do have access by faith into his throne room. Uh, it, it's not a physical presence. It's, it's, it's not as though, as we said, the body and blood is, is on the altar. But when we come by faith, we come to Christ's true presence. And so we receive grace from him to live the life he's called us to. When we see the elements on the table, we should not be drawn to adore the elements, but rather we should be drawn to adore Christ in heaven, to have faith towards him and so share in his presence. Uh, and that's how he, we truly do come to him. We truly do have his presence at the table. And so with that, believers, I hope we've seen what the scripture says about the Lord's table uh, and that contrary to what Rome teaches about the Lord's table. As I said earlier, there are many other things which are um, not correct, which they teach, uh, but we don't have time to go through all of those uh, tonight. These are the major issues regarding the Lord's table. Now, finally, I'd just like to address if there's any 
uh, that do not believe in Christ in here. Christ offers himself to you today. You may be in the Roman church. You may, uh, you may have communion with them. You may believe that you take of his physical body and blood. But I'm here to tell you that unless you come to him, unless you believe on him, then you have no part with him. You have no life. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You must come to him. You must believe on him. Otherwise, you will thirst. Otherwise, you will perish. He that eateth not the flesh of the Son of Man and drinketh not his blood has no life in them. That is, those that do not believe those that do not have faith in him. And so come by the Spirit. Come by his drawing on you, showing you that you're a sinner, showing you that you need Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And now, uh, again, believers, let's go from this place with what we've learned, and hopefully we'll be better equipped to speak to uh, our friends and family who are uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. And let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your word, for what it teaches us. Lord, we pray that we would be good stewards of what we've learned, and uh, Lord, that um, you would help us to do your will in the days ahead. Lord, we ask that you'd send someone our way that we can talk to about Christ, uh, his goodness towards us, his call on them to be saved. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with uh, those that couldn't be here with us tonight, Lord, in our church family. Uh, Lord, that you would comfort them and that you would equip them in the same way that you do us. Uh, Lord, give them opportunities to serve you and uh, Lord, help them to know that they still have fellowship with us in heaven before your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for our missionaries where they are. Help them to serve you rightly. Uh, be with our leaders in this world. Uh, help them to turn to Christ and have wisdom and strength to, the, strength to do their job in him. Lord, we ask that, again, where we've sinned against you, that you'd forgive us and that you'd keep us until the day of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.